This is the Emergency Medical Minute. Um, I want to talk about something that we don't see a ton of, but um, can be kind of just uh, a really classic presentation for an illness that you can literally, if you're looking for it, diagnose from the door. So the presentation is little old lady. Um, she has new hypoxia, but it's sort of unclear why. She looks like she's in respiratory distress, has clear lungs, um, and otherwise normal vital signs, um, and very anxious appearing. So um, you, of course, think clear lungs, hypoxia, uh, new shortness of breath, you want to work up for PE, so you do a PE study, and it's negative, and really you don't find anything. So you notice also that she has kind of droopy eyelids, and she's complaining of just really increased fatigue of late. Does that ring any bells for anybody? There you go. Yeah. So myasthenia. <laughs> MG. Myasthenia gravis, right? So it's not a super common condition. Um, it, it interestingly has kind of a bimodal distribution, so you'll see it in the second to third decade predominantly in females, um, and then it has a second distribution in the sixth to eighth decade, and that's primarily male. Obviously this lady didn't fit in either of those categories, but um, the ocular manifestations are something that is sort of prominent for people. They'll complain of, of difficulty with uh, their eyes tearing. They'll, they'll have vision problems literally because their lids are drooping because so, they have ptosis. And they'll complain of diplopia. It, the interesting thing, too, is they'll often complain that um, it's in one eye, then it's in the other eye, and it's kind of um, sometimes worse at the end of the day. Uh, so that's, that's sort of the ocular manifestations of myasthenia, which is... Uh, uh, can be a self-limited form of myasthenia. Uh, about 50% of the people who have ocular manifestations within two years will also then develop generalized symptoms. So um, some of the generalized symptoms are they kind of have fluctuating specific muscle weakness. Um, and what uh, tends to happen is um, they will have, again, better symptoms in the early part of the day, and then as, as the day goes on or after exercise, they'll notice that they have more muscle fatigue. Um, it's usually upper extremities greater than lower extremities. And then sometimes it affects more the facial muscle, muscles that you'll see. So, you know, especially in older people, they may not think too much about the weakness or the fatigue. They just kind of attribute it to age. But people will notice that their face sort of looks flat. And specifically, when they try to smile, they'll develop what's called the myasthenic sneer. So the, the corners of their that was close. Um, the corners of their mouth um, stay down, but the, the upper central lip kind of goes up so that it looks like they're kind of sneering. And then another thing, uh, kind of a late finding, but people, will no you'll notice that they have kind of a head drop. So you know, I think, oh, it's just kyphosis or something, but really they're, they're having posterior neck muscle weakness and their head kind of drops. The myasthenic crisis is what we sort of care of the most about, and ultimately this lady was in a myasthenic crisis. So her diaphragm wasn't working probably. Pro properly and her respiratory muscles were fatigued. So um, so they, they can have respiratory distress and, you know, essentially have to require intubation and mechanical ventilation because their respiratory muscles are so weak. Um, also, they're at increased risk for aspiration because sometimes with that they'll have bulbar dysphagia, so they'll have trouble swallowing, speaking, and sometimes you'll notice sort of a nasal tone of voice. Um, family may notice that, you know, because obviously you're seeing the patient for the first time, that family may, may mention that their voice has changed or they may be dysarthric. So really, um, you know, the, the Dory diagnosis is kind of this flat face, um, uh, droopy eyes, and then you find, may find that they're in respiratory distress. So um, to just kind of go backwards a little bit, the pathophysiology, does anyone remember kind of why this occurs? <laughs> right, so we're talking about the neuromuscular junction, right? So the neuromuscular junction, um, the presynaptic terminal releases acetylcholine. Acetylcholine binds to the acetylcholine receptors on the postsynaptic maybe too early for this, but <laughs> um, postsynaptic um, uh, in plate, and then you initiate a muscle contraction because of that, right? So the problem with um, myasthenia gravis is that you build up autoantibodies to the receptors. So the receptors are bound with this autoantibody, and basically, initially, the binding prevents normal muscle contraction, and then over time, the binding induces a complement-mediated destruction of the acetylcholine receptor. So over time, you can have kind of just more 
long-standing and progressive symptoms. So initially you may have kind of waxing and waning weakness that sort of resolves back to a baseline normal and then over time if you have enough receptor destruction then you have a baseline level of weakness and then you have fluctuating levels of that new baseline of, of, of generalized weakness. So um, uh, just to wrap this up in less than 18 minutes, um, <laughs> the, uh, the treatment is, so, so sorry, let's go back. Um, so diagnosis, so uh, we used to always test, uh, if you had a patient with ptosis and you were suspecting that, you'd test with something called Tensilon, the Tensilon test. Um, they no longer make that. So I had this patient, I'm like, oh, let's, you know, do a Tensilon test. And, you know, an hour and a half later, they're like, oh, yeah, we don't have that anymore. So, um, <laughs> so you can't really test for it, it's the bottom line. Uh, you can do an ice pack test on the eyes. Does anyone know what an ice pack test is? Anyone seen that? So you place an ice pack on the totic, totic eye, um, and you may see some improved muscle function, and basically this, the synapses do better at a cold temperature. So, um, so that's, that's sort of a test you can do. It's not very sensitive, obviously. Um, but if you really suspect this, the gold standard is you do a uh, very specialized muscle testing, so a specialized EMG to assess if this is really what's going on. And then finally, um, to treat, so it's an autoimmune disorder. It has autoimmune cogeners like lupus, rheumatoid, all those things. So oftentimes you end up being on some sort of immunologic therapy chronically, um, uh, steroids, of course. And then uh, the treatment for myasthenic crisis is admission to the ICU after you've tested their respiratory function and found it to be uh, suboptimal, you admit them to the ICU, watch the respiratory status, and either do plasmapheresis or immunoglobulin therapy. Obviously, plasmapheresis remove is, removes the acetylcholine antibodies and, uh, and hopefully improves their symptoms by that. So, interesting disease um, can be really serious, but definitely something that you have to sort of be thinking about before you would diagnose it. Emergency Medical Minute is, and always will be, about free medical education. Medicine's most prolific podcast is successful because of our supporters, donors, and of course, our listeners. Please like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. And if you support spreading free medical education, please donate at our website, emergencymedicalminute.com. As always, keep listening.